Dr. Larry Crabb is our guest all uh, during this uh, special stewardship emphasis. And uh, you met him yesterday, I hope you did. If you didn't, uh, he is a psychologist, he's a renowned scholar and uh, author of many books. He um, is um, traveling all over North America, holding seminars. People are listening to him in various ways, reading his stuff. And he's written this great new book called 66 Love Letters, From God to You, A Conversation with God that invites you into his story. Welcome back, Larry. Good to be with you. We, uh, we talked yesterday about um, the setting, why it is you wrote it, and uh, the general issue of biblical literacy that's out there, and the intimidate, intimidating factor. The Bible scares us. It's so deep, it's, it's so a long. It's scholars, not for Yeah, us scholars, and it, ha it does have some fairly lengthy passages that don't seem to have any redeeming social value. <laughs> but what you're saying is that, boy, there's... Uh, there's a lot of love expressed in every book of the Bible yes. from the Lord to us. So let's, let's, let's uh, you, you've divided the Bible into seven sections. Uh, you're going to do with all 66 books and we're going to follow through that uh, process. The first segment is entitled by you, A Fall, A Promise, and the Story Begins. And here we're talking about the first five books of the Bible, Genesis through Deuteronomy, the Pentateuch, uh, the Torah, um, Genesis. What is it about Genesis that impacted you? I hear God saying to me in Genesis, never underestimate the mess that you've made of things and never underestimate the power of my love to straighten the mess out. That's essentially, hmm. now it's all through there. He hmm. starts off with Adam and Eve telling God to take a hike basically. Hmm. And then um, Noah, you know, the, God looks down and says, there's nobody here that's, that's interested in me in the slightest. The big flood comes, why? I'm not sure. After the flood comes, then uh, they have the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob story, and you have Abraham, God, saying that what I'm going to do out of the message you made of your life, I'm going to turn you into a man of faith. Look at this guy called Abraham. And, then, and Isaac, what am I going to do with this guy? I'm going to see to it that, that you're going to understand that nobody comes back into my family without supernatural birth. And Isaac becomes a story of that. Abraham and Sarah, way old, shouldn't have had kids at this time, and they did. Out comes Isaac. And then Jacob comes along, and I think God's saying to us in Jacob, it took me a um, hundred years to straighten this guy out. Don't be impatient with the journey. Mm. And then Joseph comes along and I think God is saying, don't make the mistake of assuming that the journey I have you on to turn you into people that can dance at my party, don't assume it's an easy road all the time. It can be tough. And Joseph went through some pretty hard times as everybody who knows the Bible knows that. Mm. So Genesis is basically God's beginning story of I'm going to transform you back into the, what I had in mind in the first place even better but it's not going to be an easy journey for you or for me. Well, Jacob uh, is a very good example of that. God even changes his name. He changes his name, absolutely. From Jacob to Israel. One who grasps to one who struggles with God. Yeah, yeah. In the, in the Hebrew language, uh, Israel, in its barest etymological meaning is God wrestler. Yeah. <laughs> WWF in, the gen in Genesis. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I really love that. Yeah. I really love that because I, I think I'd like to, th I have to see myself as a, as a God wrestler. Yeah. You know, it doesn't come easily to me. Oh. No, oh. and, and, and these guys keep struggling. I, 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 I've highlighted several, I've gone through the whole book. I've read every word, Larry. Yeah. Uh, you get to Exodus, and um, what, you know, it's interesting, you know, if you, have, you gotta get the book, friends, you gotta get it. Um, because Larry, Larry starts out uh, the book, on, uh, uh, the uh, letter of Exodus. <laughs> God, what do you want me to hear as I read Exodus? And then you have God speaking. Yeah. He says, now hear this above all. And then whatever, whenever he speaks, you put it in bold print. Yeah. Yeah. I will do whatever it takes to carry out my plan. That could be read as despotic, as um, he's the uh, master puppeteer and yeah. we're merely dangling on a string. Pawns. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's how it could be read. But you don't read it that way. Oh, I read it just the opposite. How do you read it? I believe that if this God in fact loves, and if you finish the, all 66 love letters, you're not going to be in any question about that when you start seeing Jesus. Right. But even back in Exodus, what God is saying is that there really is something wonderful that I've created you for, and you rebel against that, but I'm going to not compromise your freedom 
I'm going to woo you back to myself. I'm not going to turn you into a robot who's going to just salute me and say whatever you say, God. You're going to want to salute me. You're going to want to let me embrace you. You're going to want to embrace me. And I'm going to do whatever it takes. It, to me, it's like, you know, when I had cancer 13 years ago and a surgeon came in and said, I got to cut you up if you want to play golf again. I got to cut you up if you want to live. And my thought is, I don't want to be cut up. And he says, well, would you rather die or would you rather live? It's like, gee, I think maybe I'd rather live. He says, all right, then lie still. Let me knock you out and cut you up. Well, was that despotic or was that loving? Right. And I believe God is looking and saying, I'm going to do whatever it takes. And you're a, you're a case of my friend, God talking to me. But I'm going to do what, what it takes to get you to be the person that you long to be and don't even know who you long to be. Now, it's interesting, this concept of becoming the person that I want you to be, that's God speaking. Yes. And this is a very profound theological truth here. He says, um, You got to imagine what it was like to begin life in the desert by hearing me lay down laws nobody could keep. You won't feel the crushing weight so until you imagine what it was like. You won't feel the crushing weight of my holiness. I remember reading one old theologian who said, uh, Before God is anything, he's holy. Yes, yes. Now, the beginning of the gospel is kind of bad news. God's it, holy and you're not. God's holy and you're not. And, but the, the spin on holiness that a lot of us have been born into or have inherited or have assumed just simply because our church subculture has taught it is a holiness of the outward appearance. Yes. Uh, a holiness that uh, uh, crushes not the spirit but crushes fun and joy. Uh, a holiness that can't be holy if there's any glitter. That's not what you're talking about. No, not at all. I mean, I was very much raised in the culture you're speaking of yeah. where you don't go to movies. I remember as a seven-year-old kid, I snuck out to a movie one day. It was a Dean Martin, Jerry Lewis movie. Right. And I walked out after 10 minutes crying. And the usher said, what's the matter, little boy? And I said, I'm a Christian. I love Jesus. I shouldn't be here. I mean, that's sad. I was having a good time. Well, the view was that you know, theaters had a rapture-proof ceiling, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I've not heard of that. <laughs> Jesus comes back. He, he, it's, he it's, like, it's, like, it's like you're under a lead shield. He can't see you there. And I, and I think for years there's been a mood in my part that without even, I think I know better, but there's something inside of me that still thinks that because I, I've never been unfaithful to my wife, I, I don't get drunk, I don't have a pornography problem, I'm doing great. Yeah. As opposed to saying, well, if that's all I think about, then I'm just a Pharisee. But if rather than that, I realize that there's something way down deep inside of me that is so different in my natural inclinations, in my urges, and in what I'm after in a given moment, there's something so different about me than there is about the three members of the Trinity. They relate so differently than me, and their holiness is how they love. My, oh, my unholiness is how I fail to love. And God's saying, I want you to feel the crushing weight of my holiness so that you will realize that you need to be transformed. You need to be changed into somebody who really loves your wife and brings incredible joy to that woman, who loves your grandkids, who loves your children, who loves other people, who really is there for them as opposed to using them to be there for you. Hmm. Jesus put it well. He said you fulfill God's ex expectation by loving God and loving neighbor. Yeah, yeah. And th there's that love thing. And oh, yeah. uh, uh, to the extent that we fulfill love, we, 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 we fulfill holiness. That's what you're saying. That's exactly what I'm saying. But it's not easy to love. No, 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 no. And it, and it comes rather unnaturally. And we don't even know when we're not doing it. Uh, when I got married 43 years ago, I stood before the preacher and said all the right words. I promised to love, honor, cherish till one of us dies. I think I put it a little nicer than that, but that was the gist of it. <laughs> till death do us till part. De I'm sorry, I didn't <laughs> get it quite right. right. <laughs> but, uh, but I really believe that what I was saying to her, looking back, there's a verse in Proverbs 20 and verse 5 that says that the purposes of a man's heart are like deep waters. You don't really see what your real purposes are. When I stood before my wife, I think I was saying this, in hindsight. I think I was saying, you don't know the struggles I had as a teenage kid. I didn't feel very popular. Yeah. You're a pretty girl. You love me. You want me. Tell you what, I'll marry you. You can keep on helping me to feel good for the rest of my life because a pretty girl likes me. A deal? And I call that a tick on a dog marriage. <laughs> Problem in most marriages, you have two ticks and no dog. <laughs> a tick and a dog marriage? Yeah. And you ask your wife to be the dog, which is kind of a little insulting. <laughs> so what does it you're, mean the, to, you're the parasite. What, is it, what does it mean to reverse that and yeah. to say that God has given me something that I can give you? Yeah, yeah. That's what love is all about. Yeah. This is terrific. Well,